guys. Everyone, I'm just letting uh, letting people into the meeting. Give me just a second. We'll give it a minute for other people to join, and then we'll start. Okay. We're gonna do um, 5.4 today, which is really short, and then um, and then we're gonna do 6.2, which is longer. Uh, so anyway, make sure you have your lecture notes for both of those sections. Okay. Um, just as a reminder, so I posted um, yesterday video links for both um, the lecture from yesterday as well as the office hours from yesterday. The office hours from yesterday had, um, I went over the exam and um, I posted the solutions to the exam as well. I think that's under the regular course documents. The lect uh, video lecture, I'm sorry, the video for the exam going over, um, I posted in the lecture videos uh, area. So you kind of have all the videos in one spot. Um, so you want to go ahead and check that out if you want to um, compare your stuff, your solutions with um, uh, with what's up there online. Also, like you can just take a look at um, my posted solutions if you want to check um, for the uh, variance portion on the continuous joint um, distribution. <laughs> I did a, a different method than some of you guys did. Um, both methods are both methods are fine, um, and we should get the same answer if there weren't any like algebraic or other mistakes. Um, in the process of it, but you're welcome to um, take a look. Hang on a sec. Um, but you should be there. Okay, good. Um, okay, so just as a reminder too, we have homework that's due on Thursday at midnight. The homework is um, chapter 5.3 um, to 6. Point, um, geez, I think it's going to be 6.3. Yes, 6.3. It's um, I think 6.4 we'll probably get to on Thursday. It's not clear. Um, I didn't include that in this week's um, assignment list. Um, so we'll just have to keep in mind it'll be on next week's. Okay, so with that said, let's go ahead and get started on chapter 5.4. This is, um, chapter 5.4 is a little bit out of order. Um, we probably should have done this right after we did the whole maximum likelihood estimate because um, this is building on that topic. But anyway, we have it here, so we're going to talk about it. So chapter 5.4, this is called Properties of Estimators. Okay, so properties of estimators. So you remember our maximum likelihood method um, where we have a, a whole sample of data, right? And then we're gonna use this sample of data to come up with an estimate for the mean of the population for maybe the variance of the population. Um, and so we want to be able to take a look at, we call this the maximum likelihood. This is like the mean of that population based on our sample set. Using this method, we're gonna find the um, the value that's going to have the highest probability, the maximum likelihood of being an estimate for the mean or the variance, depending on what we're checking for. Um, and we checked for different things. We did um, mean variance. I think we did proportion as well. So we're going to talk about those today. Um, and there we go. Okay. So the problem that happens is because our estimate is based on um, our sample set, we don't know if our estimate's like going to be a good estimate, is it close to the actual true mean or true variance, or is it um, pretty far away? So we're going to want to talk about what that means in terms of biased or unbiased estimators. Okay, so let's um, we'll write down what our problem is. Okay, so the problem that we're dealing with is um, if we have, we've got two methods, which we only talked about one. The other method is the method of moments. Um, I think that that method gets covered in the um, class that's the sequel to this one. I think it's is it 4081? I'm trying to remember the number, but it's basically um, taking the material from this class and then doing um, other options for it. And I think they cover the method of moments in that class. But if we have got two methods um, for estimating, it's methods for estimating some likelihood, like a parameter. likelihood values. So if these two methods, right, that we're doing are going to give um, two different values for, say, the mean or for the variance or whatever, <clears throat> these two methods give um, different results. 
which one, which result should you choose? Or which one should you use? Which one should you use? Which one use? Okay. So um, like, why does this matter? Because like, basically, let's take a look. So I've got, um, say my true, my truth theta, whatever my, if I'm estimating like the mean or the variance or something, and I've got my likelihood function, right? And it's a function of theta. So this is my function of theta, we'll call it function of theta hat, right? So this is where our estimate is. So our estimate, right, our estimate's peaking here, and this is where our true theta is. So our estimate's actually not too far away from where our true mean is, right? So this is a pretty good, um, we'll call this a good estimate, um, which means that it's like, oops, there you go. It's more centered. <clears throat> on the true theta, right? So the f of theta, our peak for the f of theta, our function of theta, right? This is our likelihood function. We found this theta hat. It's pretty close to our true true value. Now the true value is unknown, but, but we're trying to gather samples that are gonna represent a true population value. And let's say, for example, we've got um, our true theta, right? And then I'm gonna really exaggerate this. So here's, here's my function of theta, theta hat. Right, so this one is not very well centered on where our true theta is, right? So this one is gonna, we'll call this one, we're gonna say that this method here is gonna give an estimate that are too large. Like it's overestimated what the true theta is actually gonna be. So, but how do I know, right? I'm just working with samples. I've gathered a bunch of samples um, and, and I'm coming up with this theta hat and I'm doing everything that, right, that I'm supposed to be doing, but so I don't really know what the true theta is. How do I know if I'm close or not? So um, one of the things that we're gonna be working with um, in this chapter, it's a very short chapter, but it's called, how do we know if we're dealing with what's called an unbiased estimator? Okay, so let's talk about what an unbiased estimator is. So um, in a sense, our estimators, are going to take on different values from sample to sample, right? Um, so I, I gather a bunch of data um, here, and I come up with some kind of an estimate. I gather a bunch of data here. I get, um, you know, come up with some kind of an estimate. You know, depending on, you know, um, what's going on, maybe my theta hat's going to be underestimated or overestimated, depending on the samples that I'm gathering, right? So, so I also, we wanna have like really large sample numbers to help us kind of even that out. So it's gonna be, um, because the estimators themselves are essentially random variables, right? And they come from our samples that we're gathering. Um, so, some of our theta hats will overestimate. They're gonna overestimate our true theta. And then some theta hats, let's go up, some theta hats are gonna underestimate. Our true theta. All right. Mm. Okay, so we need to come up with some kind of a definition for all this, and then we have to have some kind of a method for figuring out if we've got a biased or an unbiased estimator. Okay, and, and then if we find out that we have a biased estimator, once we know what that bias is, then when we come up with our um, theta hat, we can divide by that bias so we can get rid of it. All right, so I'm going to... Um, Turn the page on this. Everybody have this. Anybody need more time to write down what I have written down here? Give me one sec. Okay. Okay. So let's come up with our definition. We're gonna go through some concepts and then we'll work through um, an, our example, our one example for this chapter. So our definition, we're gonna say we've got x1, x2, x3, all the way up to x sub n, okay? These are our random samples 
from a continuous probability density function, our PDF, right? Probability density function. We'll call that f of x theta. Remember, this is our, right? It looks multivariable, but really it's just a function of theta is our estimator, right? Because we don't know what theta is. Where theta is the unknown parameter. Most likely, um, oops, that's just a parameter. Most likely, theta is probably going to be your mean as your unknown parameter um, because uh, we you know it's the most important part. We're trying to find the mean, and then we from the mean we can figure out what our variance is. Okay, so we're going to say an estimator um, theta hat, and remember theta hat is a function of all of these. All these samples. Remember, we did our likelihood function, and we took we figured out what the maximum likelihood estimate is for this. So theta hat is a function of um, our uh, samples. So theta hat is said to be unbiased okay, for theta, right? Um, <clears throat> if the expected value of theta hat is equal to theta. Okay, so it's a process. So we figure out what theta hat is, right? doing our maximum likelihood method say for example and then um and then we do ex the expected value using theta hat we plug it in and we see if we get theta out if we get theta out then it means it's unbiased if we get some theta times something else okay then that something else is going to be our bias that we need to compensate for if we want to make um things unbiased all theta so um let's talk about what that means Let's just remember, I'm gonna put up a couple of things to remember in terms of um, things. So first, um, if X sub I, all of our samples, um, is a Bernoulli random variable. And I keep using this term Bernoulli random variable instead of saying the samples come from a binomial experiment, right? Yes or no. Um, we say Bernoulli random variable because our book is using that term. I want to get you familiar with the term Bernoulli random variable. Um, variable with parameter oops, P. Okay. So um, if it's Bernoulli random variable with um, parameter P, P, then that means that um, P hat, our estimate for P is going to be 1 over N, the sum from I equals 1 to N, all of the X of I's, right? So we're summing up all the X of I's. We're basically taking an average, right, of all of our, this is, this tells us, remember X of I in a Bernoulli is 1 if it's a success, 0 if it's a failure. So if I sum up all of these 1s and zeros, I'm going to have basically the number of successes, right? and then divided by the total number of trials. This is our proportion, essentially. Okay, this is our maximum likelihood estimate, MLE, our parameter P of our proportion, okay? MLE, remember, is maximum likelihood estimate. Okay, we often call it MLE, I think, in the book or in our notes and stuff like that. So kind of get used to seeing uh, maximum likelihood estimate um, used as uh, MLE as initials. Okay, so that's for Bernoulli. Let's talk about um, continuous. So if we have a continuous random variable, let's say X sub I are normally distributed random variables. Okay, so remember if it's Bernoulli, it's discrete, which means I use summation. Okay, if it's normally distributed, it's continuous, so I use integrals. Okay, I'm not going to mix my integrals and my summations because their summations are the same thing as integrals except with discrete values. Okay, so x of i, now we're talking about normally distributed random variables, so we're talking about continuous random variables with mean mu and variance sigma squared. Okay, so then our mu hat, our estimate, our maximum likelihood estimate for our mean is going to be, I'm going to sum up all of my sample values and I'm going to divide by the total number that I have, taking the average, right? The mean of my sample values. And my variance, okay, my variance estimator, okay, is going to be 
the sum from x by minus x bar, right? So I find out what my x bar, this is my mu hat, x bar squared all over n. Okay, that gives me my variance. This is the maximum likelihood estimate of our variance, and this is our maximum likelihood estimate of our mean. Oops, not our mean hat, of our mean, okay? All right, just a reminder, because we're gonna be using these terms here when we work through our example. The example doesn't have numbers in it. It's more like, what does it mean to look like a, um, a biased estimator or not? We only have one example, and it's more, we're just using variable names because it's kind of like a roofy type of example. Okay, so we're gonna work through, I'll give you guys a second to finish writing this out, and then if you wanna take out your single page, it's only one example for um, chapter 5.4. Anybody? need more time to write down what we have here. Okay, good. All right, so let's start with um, chapter 5.4. So this is our example one. So example one says we've got the normally um, distributed, this is normally distributed, um, distributed, x sub i, okay, so these are our random variables x sub i with mean mu and um, standard deviation sigma, and we want to find out, um, this actually should be um, variance here. Um, sorry, this should be a variance. It looks like these, um, my uh, formatting didn't come through. So this is mu and variance and mu hat and the variance hat. Okay, so these are our, we wanna know if our mean hat and our variance hat are unbiased estimators. Okay, so let's take a look. Um, so maybe you guys wanna make a note in your notes here that those should be variances. Okay, so um, first off, right, let's take some notes and think about what we're trying to do. So um, the first thing I wanna do is my expected value of all my x sub i's is going to be the mean, right? Um, and my variance of all my expected values is going to be my variance. Okay, a variance of my samples is going to be my variance. Okay, so now if I say the expected value, okay, of my sample mean, right, this is like x bar is I've taken all my samples and I've taken the average of all of them, okay, it's going to be the expected value. I'm going to plug in. Like, so instead of using x bar, I'm going to actually plug in what that x bar is. So this is the expected value of 1 over n. I'm going to sum up i equals 1 to n, all of my x sub i's, right? So that was just taking what we wrote here, right? So I'm going to sum these up, and I'm going to put them here. I'm going to put the actual formula in here for my um, expected value. And now I'm going to actually do the expected value with this here. So this is like saying I'm the 1 over n is a constant. So 1 over n, sum i equals 1 to n. Um, the expected value of x sub i, okay, it's I'm moving things around, is equal to 1 over n, sum i equals 1 to n of our mean, right, because our expected value of x sub i is our mean, so I'm substituting it in right here, and that's equal to, if I sum up my mean, if I, if I said uh, mu plus mu plus mu plus mu plus mu, that's like saying n times mu, so it's 1 over n from before times n times the mean, okay, this n times the mean is, I'm summing up the mean n times, right? So these n's are gonna cancel, and this is equal to the mean. So that means that my expected value of my estimator is equal to the mean itself. All right, that's good, that's a good thing. So let's write this out. So since the expected value of our sample mean is equal to our mean itself, we just showed it with this example, the maximum likelihood estimate for the mean is unbiased. And we say it's unbiased because there's no coefficient. It's just plain mu, right? I don't have like, you know, some set of numbers. I don't have like variables. I don't have anything else being multiplied. Once I've substituted in the formula and to work it out through here, I don't have anything hanging out front. It's just plain mu, which is what we want, right? We want this to be an unbiased estimator. So we've just shown that our mean right? The maximum likelihood estimate for our mean is an unbiased estimator. Okay, that's good. All right, <laughs> so let's take a look at our variance now. Can we go to look at the variance? So let's, so let's do this. So our maximum likelihood estimate for our variance, sigma squared, is equal to 1 over n, i equals 1 to n, x of i squared minus x bar squared. Okay, so we're plugging in. This is our um, you know, the, uh, sorry, where were we? Um, right here. Okay, so we're plugging in our values, okay, for things, okay, and this is our maximum likelihood estimate for our sigma squared. Okay, so we're going to use this 
right? We're going to plug this in and take the um, uh, uh, expected value of that. Okay, so let's do this. So because sigma squared is equal to 1 over n, the sum, so I'm going to start working this through x sub i minus x bar quantity squared, then this, my expected value is going to be 1 over n sum x sub i squared minus, I'm foiling this out now, 2x sub i x bar plus x bar squared. All I did was foil this out. Okay, so I've got this x sub i minus x bar quantity squared. This is it foiled out. Okay, now we're going to distribute this sigma here. This is 1 over n sum x sub i squared minus 2x bar times 1 over n sum x sub i. I, I like right, I'm taking this and I'm distributing it into here, but the um, 2 times the x bar is a constant term. I'm going to pull that out x sub i because this is the sum of i to n. Okay, this right here, by the way, is also x bar. So I'm going to substitute that back, back in in just a minute. Plus 1 over n times n x bar squared. Okay, the, why do I get the n times x bar squared? It's because x bar squared is being summed up n times, right? So I'm gonna, that's basically like saying n times x bar. And then I've got this 1 over n that's being multiplied by it. Okay, so let's go ahead and rewrite this out. So I've got 1 over n <coughs> sum x of i squared minus x bar squared, right? So, right, this is um, 2 times x bar squared um, plus, plus x bar squared. So I can add them together, just get a single x bar squared, okay? So now, this is expected value of sigma hat squared is equal to, I'm going to, I'm going to write out the answer first and then I'm going to show you where I got that from, from here. So the answer is n minus one sigma squared all over n. Okay. I'm going to show you in just a minute where that comes from. But this right here is our bias. There's a multiplier in front of my sigma squared. If it was unbiased, my expected value of sigma hat squared would equal sigma squared. But I've got this n minus one time uh, divided by n. That's our, our bias term. So whenever I find out, whenever I get a maximum likelihood estimator from my variance, okay, I have to divide it by n minus one all over n in order for it to be unbiased. Okay, that's my the term that I need to um, control with. So let me show you how where this comes from. Um, let me just I'll circle this. Okay, so our bias, so this is a biased estimator. Okay, so let's actually, I'll show you the work here. Where did that value come from? Okay, so let's write it out. Um, I need some more room. Okay, so this comes from <coughs> excuse me. Our expected value for sigma squared is equal to the expected value. I'm going to start plugging things in. 1 over n sum x sub i squared minus x bar squared. Okay, So I have to take this, I'm going to do the expected value of this. I'm substituting just like we did when we did the mean, the expected value. So this is going to be 1 over n sum expected value of x sub i squared minus expected value of x bar squared. Okay. All right, so I'm going to keep working through. So this is equal to um, 1 over n sum from i equals 1 to n. <clears throat> sigma squared plus mu squared minus sigma squared all over n plus mu squared. I'm just substituting in the values that we had from before, okay, from here, from these values here, okay, and then from what our variance and what our maximum likelihood estimator is, okay, from all these values. So I'm substituting in for these different values. Okay, now I'm going to keep um, cleaning up my algebra here. A lot of algebra in these biased and unbiased estimators. So this is one over n, n sigma squared plus n mu squared minus sigma squared over n minus mu squared. Okay, so I distributed, and then I'm going to combine. I'm going to combine, and this is going to look like sigma squared minus sigma squared over n. Which, when I factor out this n here, I'm going to get n minus one all over n times sigma squared. Okay, I expected this which doesn't equal to my sigma hat squared. Okay, I want my sigma hat squared to be equal to sigma squared to be unbiased. 
Okay, so because actually this is equal to our estimator here, but it doesn't equal to plain old sigma squared. Sigma squared. In order for it to be unbiased, right? This would not have to be there. Okay, so when I have my maximum likelihood estimate for the variance, I have to divide it by this in order to make it unbiased. But my mean, I can just leave, right? Because the maximum likelihood estimate for the mean is an unbiased estimator. I, I would suggest, it may sound confusing, like what are we talking about here? Take a look at the homework problems for 5.4. You're gonna be working through calculating expected values and seeing if it equals what you started with or what you expect to have, okay? If you're left with some kind of multiplier, okay, that multiplier is your bias, okay? And so you're gonna to need to divide by that multiplier in order to, for your estimate to be an unbiased estimator, okay? But that's it for 5.4, essentially. And it probably should have been tacked on to the chapter where we did um, uh, estimators, mass, maximum likelihood estimates, because um, this is a topic about that, but whatever, <laughs> of how our book is set up. Okay. Like I said, it may seem confusing, like what are we trying to do? Make sure you have this, I'll scan this in later today so you guys can have it to look at. Um, take a look at the homework problems, okay, for 5.4, and then um, we'll answer questions with the homework problems, because it'll be more clear as you're trying to work through it. I'm gonna, everybody have this, I'm gonna um, take this away and start chapter 6.2. Okay, great. So 6.2 is actually really exciting because we're now getting into statistics, pretty um, much more um, involved statistics. So chapter 6.2, doing what we call hypothesis testing. Okay. All right, so now um, let's take it, just take a step back and think about things. So in the first half of the class, we talked about probabilities, right? And then we started taking those probabilities and we started building them into um, probability density functions or mass functions, depending on um, if it was discrete or continuous. And then we said, well, geez, even if it is discrete, if we've got like, if it's binomial, yes or no, we have a lot of test cases that we're doing, it's going to line up nicely with a normal distribution, okay? So a lot of what we're gonna be doing is assuming that the data are normally distributed, okay, which is our nice bell curve, okay, which allows us to use our Z tables, or ultimately we're gonna work into what we call a T table. You'll see what that is later. Um, we're gonna use these, okay, these values to help us make um, statistical judgments about different populations or different ideas, different, um, I've got um, uh, an idea that my mean is here, but maybe my mean's greater than, or maybe my mean's less than, or maybe my mean's just not equal to that. And so um, the hypothesis testing is taking our statistics, okay, and um, with that normal curve, you know how we were doing those like Z values, and we're gonna, based on those Z values, we're gonna start making statistical inferences about um, the data and what we're seeing. And underlying it all is our probability density function that is normally distributed, our bell curve, okay. so. I'll try to draw out pictures when I can so that we can um, understand graphically like where all this stuff is um, taking shape. Okay, so let's write down first off, you know, so we're on the same page with vocabulary. Let's write down, what is the hypothesis? You've probably heard it um, in other classes or on co-ops if you've been on it. So hypothesis is basically just an idea that is testable, okay? Um, it's basically like a, you know, um, I think that um, people who have lost their hearing, you know, maybe they can perceive frequencies in a different range. So I need to um, design an experiment that's going to test um, people's hearing levels, okay, over different frequency values. Okay, my hypothesis is that um, if your hearing level is here, you will perceive better over there. That's the hypothesis that I need to test, say, for example. So it's an idea that's testable. It becomes the basis for an experiment. Um, it's what we can also say is a conjecture um, about a parameter. We want to make it so that we're really only talking about one thing because we want to um, reduce our experiment down to just testing one thing at a time um, so that it kind of reduces the compounds in the data. If we have too many things happening all at once, it's going to be hard to piece out like what's actually causing the results that we're getting. And so this all thing would be tested in an experiment. Okay. All right, so hypothesis. So let's talk about the different types of hypothesis that we can have. There's something called the null hypothesis. And we typically call that H naught, 
h sub zero. Okay, so our null hypothesis, okay, this is um, a statistical hypothesis that states there is no difference between a parameter and a specific value. It's kind of like our default, right? So if I say um, your frequency is here and my null hype, and I'm gonna test, maybe my claim is that the frequency is there. The null hypothesis says there's no difference between the frequency here and the frequencies that I'm testing. Okay, so the null hypothesis says that there's no significant difference between my claim, where, where I'm starting from, and where I'm actually getting values from. That's our null hypothesis. What we call the alternative, alternate hypothesis, hypothesis we call that one H sub one, alternative hypothesis. Um, this is a hypothesis that states that there is a difference. When we say there is a difference, there isn't a difference, we use statistics to help us make that inference. Okay, so I'm not just saying, oh yeah, I think there's no difference there. I actually have to prove it with math. Okay, that's the whole point of this chapter here and what we're going to be doing forward, which is at what level statistically can we say that there is or is not a difference um, between a parameter and a specific value. Or the alternative hypothesis could be that there's actually like a difference between two parameters or difference between two parameters. So null hypothesis versus alternative hypothesis, these are the things that we're gonna be testing. And as we work through our examples for chapter six and beyond, we're going to be stating. We're going to state what my null hypothesis is. I'm going to state what the alternative hypothesis is. I'm going to work through the statistics based on what we're reading in our problem. And then we're going to um, state our conclusion based on the math that we're getting out between all these. Okay. So we're going to look at, um, hang on a sec. Okay. So we're going to look at um, hypothesis tests. Um, For, the, for various things. So um, we're going to basically look at um, our hypothesis test for our difference in mu values, right? Mu um, mu one minus mu two. Do I have, I've got, I think my mean is here. I think it's not here. I think there's a difference in the two means. We're going to talk about that. We're going to take a look at um, variances, okay? If we have time, we'll look at um, a ratio of variances, okay? So I'm going to write if time. That's um, really neat, but we'll, we'll see if we get that. We're going to look at proportions. So our P, okay, we're going to use that as the basis, and we're also going to look at the difference in two proportions. Right, so the mean and the proportion, these are similar ideas, right? Um, one's uh, continuous, one's discrete, okay? So what happens is, based on the statistics that we do, right, so um, based on our statistical analysis, okay, we're either going to reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis, or we're going to fail to reject. Let me write that down. We'll talk about, because there's actually, it seems like I'm being specific, and I am. Okay, um, we'll either reject the null hypothesis, Right. So based on my statistics, I can say, oh, there is a difference between these things. Um, or I'm going to fail to reject our null hypothesis. We don't never actually accept the null hypothesis. We just say we're just not going to reject it. So I either reject it based on statistics or I fail to reject. Okay, we don't say we don't accept it. Okay. 
And that's an important distinction because um, we're never actually uh, accepting something. We're just saying based on the statistics, we're going to reject something or not reject something. So let's talk about, I'm going to give you guys a second to finish writing that. And then uh, I'll talk about what these things look like graphically and then three different pieces for how these things can hold together. Anybody need more time to write this down? Okay. All right. So let's talk about our different types of statistics. Well, fail to reject the, the null hypothesis is like saying that we accept. That we what? If failing to reject it is saying that we accept it. No. <laughs> like a hypothesis? No, we never actually accept a null hypothesis. We just, we either show that there's a difference in these values, which means we reject the null hypothesis because that says there is no difference between them, right? So we reject the null hypothesis in showing that they're statistically different, or we fail to reject, which means based on the data that we have, I just don't have enough data to conclude that there's a difference between them. Okay, so I'm never oh, actually okay. I'm never actually saying I accept the alternative hypothesis or I accept the null hypothesis. You don't really commit, right? You just say I'm going to reject the null hypothesis at the statistical level that we're working at. Okay, because at the statistical level that we're working at, based on what we have, it looks like there's a difference. So I can reject the null hypothesis because the null hypothesis says there's no difference between them. Okay, based on the statistics that we have, if the statistics show that there isn't a difference between them, I don't say I accept the null, I just say I'm not going to reject it based on what we have. There isn't enough data to reject it. Okay, so we're never actually accepting things, we just reject or we don't reject. Okay. It's, it seems like a nuance, but it's important, okay? Because statistics is all about making inferences okay, based on the data that you have, okay? So I, I never have, I never feel confident enough because I, I never have enough um, ability, money, time, whatever, to pull the whole world and get all the data that I need, okay? I'm just gonna, you know, work with, you know, smaller populations and make inferences about the larger ones, okay? So based on that, I can't say conclusively that this is definitely true. I just can only say I'm going to reject it or I'm not going to reject it. Okay, so <clears throat> let's talk about things. So we've got um, what's called, oh, I'm going to call it CV, is our critical value. Okay, and our critical value is based on our Z value. Remember our Z value, that was the difference between our X bar and our mean divided by sigma divided by radical N. Okay, that gives us something, it normalizes our data so I can use that standard normal table. Okay, to look up my z-value. Z-value is going to be able to define um, places within our normal curve, okay, that are going to set up critical regions. Okay, we're going to, I'm going to write all this stuff down and draw pictures out so that you can see it, but just so that you know, our z-value becomes something that we call a critical value. It's used to make a decision. Do we reject or do we not reject? That kind of thing. So let's talk about, um, what things can look like. So if I've got um, my normal curve like this, okay, for example, and I have some mean value, right? Let's say our mean value is equal to 82, right? So for example, so my, then my null hypothesis is that our mean is equal to 82, okay? The alternative hypothesis is that the mean is not equal to 82. If we say the mean is not equal to 82, what that means is, that the mean could be greater than 82 or it could be less than 82. So I'm going to shade in these regions here. I'm going to shade in these regions here. These regions that are shaded in are called critical regions. The critical region, and this is a critical region. Remember, these are still probabilities, right? This the area in this critical region is a probability, right? This value here that defines the beginning of these critical regions is defined as my Z alpha over two, right? Because I've split my alpha into two different pieces. I have to use Z alpha over two. That's my negative Z alpha over two. This is my positive Z alpha over two, okay? That's, there's a little arrow saying it starts right there. Um, because that Z alpha over two is gonna tell me, based on my Z table, then 
this region here is defined as the probability, right, that z alpha over 2 is less than some critical value, okay? So now, um, and that comes from our, what we call a two-tailed test. And it's a two-tailed test because I've got the lower tail and the upper tail. So we call it a two-tailed test. And it comes when we say, and we're going to read these out in our examples. Okay, in the examples, we'll be able to tell, we're going to start, how do we decode these examples to know if it's two-tailed, right-tailed, or left-tailed? And we're going we're gonna to talk about that. But when our alternative hypothesis is that the mean, say, for example, is not equal to something that's called a two-tailed test, because it could be greater than or less than. Okay, so some potential critical values that we can get On a two-tailed test, right? So remember, if our alpha is equal to 0 0.01, alpha is now going to become the basis for our statistic. We're going to say, do this test at the alpha 0 0.05 level or alpha 0 0.01 level. Okay, remember, I have to take my alpha over 2, use that alpha over 2 to look up to find my z value. So it's going to be plus or minus z alpha over 2, which in this case is going to be plus or minus 1.65. This is my critical value. Okay, so I divided 0 0.01 divided by two, right? And I looked that value up on my probability table and I found the corresponding Z value that's associated with 0 0.01 divided by two. So for example, alpha equals 0 0.05. We, we did this one um, the other day. We have to do alpha over two. So I find my plus or minus z alpha over two. Okay, so I had to take 0 0.05 divided by two, look for my z values that are gonna correspond to that. It's plus or minus 1.96, right? So this is positive 1.96, this is negative 1.96. Those become the z values that demarcate the regions on our curve that set up our critical regions. We're gonna talk in a minute about how do I use this stuff? I'm just trying to give you the background on what to look for. Another common one <coughs> is, um, uh, I'm sorry, this is point zero. I'm sorry, this is 0 0.1, 0 0.1, this is 0 0.01, um, alpha over two. I thought that uh, z value looked kind of high. So um, plus or minus, again, z alpha over two. This is going to give us plus or minus 2.58. And all these I got from our z table. Okay, that's a two-tailed test. That's when our hypothesis, null hypothesis, and our alternative hypothesis is not equal. That's the first one. Wait, the first alpha is 0.1. Sorry, yes, I, I wrote that wrong. It's just 0.1, okay? And then this is 0 0.05, this is 0 0.1. So the alphas get smaller as we go, right? So it was 0.1. I wrote that down wrong. So now this is our two-tailed test. We're going to talk about a right-tailed test. So right-tailed test is going to look like, let's draw it out first. This is all based on normal distribution. I'm, this should be symmetric. I'm not a great artist. Um, it's centered at our mean. And let's say, for example, um, and I'm just pulling these numbers out, our mean is equal to 36, say, for example. Um, our right-tailed test demarcates a value that um, has the right-hand tail as our critical region. Okay, so I'm going to write this out. This is our critical region. Okay, this critical region. So our hypothesis is going to look like my null hypothesis states that the mean is equal to some value of 36. My alternative hypothesis states that um, <clears throat> the mean is actually greater than 36. Greater than, right? That's why we're on the right tailed edge that says, right, our critical region is going to be to the right hand side of our mean. These are the values that are greater than our mean. Okay, we will see this in the description of the problem that we're working on. Okay, so um, also let's write this out. I'll do this in a different color. This is um, a non critical region. This is also a non. Okay, so the critical region is our shaded region that's defined by alpha or alpha over two. Okay, the non-critical region isn't right in here. We're going to talk about how we're going to use these to make statistics. Okay, so now um, this is that. So in this case here, our critical values 
Okay, we're gonna be looking up our Z values based on our alpha. Okay, so this is, in this case, we would say alpha equals 0 0.1, right? Our critical value, which is Z alpha, these are just positive values because they're on the right-hand side, 1.28. Notice how it's different because I'm now, I'm not splitting this up into Z alpha over two. I have the pure, this area under this curve is 0.1, okay? Or the area under the curve is, Point, um, zero 0.05, so my critical value is my Z alpha, <clears throat> which is one positive 1.65, 1. or my alpha is equal to 0 0.01, my critical value is Z alpha, what's alpha, which is positive 2.33. You don't have to worry if, if you're not quite, if you don't, you don't have to memorize these, these are from the table. Okay, I looked up, you know, where is my probability equal to 0 0.05, and I found the Z value associated with that, okay? I only want the positive one because we're talking about the right hand part of it. Okay. So this spot right here is my Z Wait, alpha. So it's not Z alpha divided by two? Exactly, because look, right? <clears throat> so what's happening is I had to split my alpha into these two regions right there on the two tailed test, right? So my, my alpha gets split. If my alpha is 0 0.05, the alpha, the area that's in my critical region is 0 0.05 divided by two. It's equally shape, right, because there's symmetry on our normal curve. So this is 0 0.025, that's 0 0.025. On a right-tailed test, and on a left-tailed test, we'll see in a minute, on a right-tailed test, this whole region here, there's nothing to split. This whole thing is just equal to, the area under this curve is equal to alpha, okay? And that Z alpha, see it's just Z alpha now, defines that boundary line, right, where that's going to say the area under this is equal to alpha. Um, so this is alpha here. I can write that. This is alpha over two, alpha over two, the area under that curve. Okay. It's a right tailed test. And we'll do a left tailed test. It's going to look just like the right tailed test, only we're dealing with negative values for our Z. Okay, so on a left tailed test, right, it's going to look like. Um, it out. So this is our mean, say for example, right in the center, and then um, our z value, right, our critical region is going to be to the left hand side. I'll shade this in here. Okay, okay so now what that's going to look like is <clears throat> my null hypothesis, my mean, um, we can just pick some values. My mean is equal to some value. My alternative hypothesis is that the mean is less than that. Okay, you can see it, right? It's on the less than portion of my graph. Right, so let's write down some, some values of what we're working with here. So um, this right here is our critical region. This is our non-critical region. important to keep that in mind because we're going to use these ideas of critical regions to help us make um, a judgment about our statistics. Okay, this right here is our Z alpha. It's going to be a negative Z alpha, right? So these are from um, critical values, some common ones. This is not all. I mean, we could specify any alpha level we want. This is from our Z table. So some of these critical values that we can choose. So alpha is 0 0.1. Right, our critical value is Z alpha, but it's a negative Z alpha, which is negative 1.28, right? So there's symmetry, right? So it, when alpha was equal to 0.1, so my, this, is, this is my alpha. If the area under the curve is equal to 0.1. That corresponds to, on a right tail test, a positive Z value, on a left tail test, a negative Z value. So it's negative there. Alpha equals 0 0.05. My critical value is negative Z alpha which is negative 1.65. And again, alpha equals 0 0.01. My critical value is negative Z alpha, which is negative 2.33. So they all give us these, and these Z values, these are just like examples, okay? I pulled these from the Z table. So you can, we can specify any kind of alpha level that we want, right? And that'll help us, we can just figure out what that Z corresponding Z alpha or Z alpha over two value is gonna be from our Z table, okay? <clears throat> So two-tailed test, looks like this. Right-tailed test, 
left tail test. And the hypotheses, alternative hypotheses, shake down like this. So mu is less than. That means that my values are dealing with the less than portion of my normal curve. Okay. Essentially, we're talking about the means are statistically the same. Okay. Our alternative hypothesis says that the means are statistically different. And they're less than, or they're greater than, or they're just not equal. They could be less than or greater than. Okay. Let me give you guys a second to finish writing and drawing all that out. We're going to use all this stuff um, in our examples so that you'll get a chance to see over and over and over again the different ways that this is set up. So um, go ahead and write this down so that you kind of have it, so you can think about it as a reference point. And then our examples are going to show you how this actually gets used. Does anybody need more time to write this? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Let me know when you're ready. Okay, thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. All right, so got a couple different ways, a couple different tests that we can use to um, make this happen. Um, so we've got two ways or methods of making a decision. Okay, the first method is doing our Z test which is like what I just showed you, this is the one, um, which is what I just showed you on, on the previous page, which was I've got this you know, graph, I come up with the Z value, and based on the Z values, I, I can make some kind of a decision. Um, the other one is called using the P value, and P meaning probability, okay, not proportion, but probability. Okay, so we're looking at probabilities of things. We're gonna go through examples of both, okay, so that you can see um, how, uh, how these things you know, how these things get used. You're going to come up with the same answer either way, whether it's the Z test or the P value. They're related to each other. You know, they're just different methods, and you will be asked to do both. Okay, so keep that in mind. Um, on the quiz, on the exam, on the final exam, you're going to be asked to either, you know, do the P value method or, or, or you can make your own choice, but we'll teach you both. Okay, so, for example, if we do the Z test, so the Z test means that um, we're using our Z value in order to make our statistical um, decision, okay? So um, <clears throat> we're gonna talk about the test for a mean of a population, okay? So what we want to do the Z test, we want our N to be greater than or equal to 30, so we have enough statistical power to actually use a normal distribution. Okay, so if the n is greater than 30, we can assume that the population is normally distributed. If the um, n is less than 30, I have to tell you that the population is normally distributed. Often, we're going to tell you. We can make the assumption that the population is distributed, okay? So, but if it's greater than 30, I don't really have to tell you because it's um, the law of large numbers tells us that we're getting into um, normally distributed stuff. Um, so we're going to do things where um, our uh, variance, our sigma, is known. Okay, so this is our population standard deviation. Okay, not the sample standard deviation. We'll talk about the um, sample standard deviation stuff later. So a little bit what we're doing is kind of academic, where we're dealing with the population standard deviation. Okay, so that means that our z value, remember, is um, our sample mean minus our mu, right? That's our population mean sigma over radical n. So this is our sample size, right? And we're making and the sigma is our population. So let's write down what all these things are. This is our sample mean. Mu is our population mean. This is the part that's hypothesized. Okay. Um, and then sigma is our population standard deviation. Okay, and then n, let me scroll up. 
and is our sample size. Okay. You know this already, we've been talking about it, but this is the Z value that we're gonna be using when we do stuff. Okay, so if you want, um, I'm gonna take out my lecture examples for chapter 6.2. We're gonna start working through some examples. Okay. As a chance to write that down. So as we're working through these examples, you want to put your answer in a specific format. Um, and I'll tell you what that format is as we go. Any think you guys are okay with this? I'm gonna put this down here. All right, so um, example one: a researcher believes that the age of medical doctors in a large hospital is older than the average age of medical doctors in the United States, which is 46 years old. Assume that the population is normally distributed and that the population standard deviation is 4.2 years. A random sample of 30 doctors, so we didn't really, with sample equals 30, we didn't have to say it's normally distributed, but it's good that we do. A random sample of 30 doctors from this hospital is selected, and the mean age is 48.6. Test the claim at the alpha 0 0.05 level. All right, so let's start taking notes and writing down what we have. So the first thing I'm going to write down is what's my hypothesis? Okay, my number one thing is hypothesis. So my hypothesis is, right? that my uh, mean is equal to 46 years, okay? And then my alternative hypothesis, I'm gonna say versus, my alternative hypothesis, which is that the mean is greater than 46 years old. This is our claim, right? And we get this greater than because, um, the, oh look, the age of medical doctors is older. Age is greater than the average, okay? So that's where, how I know which hypothesis to use, right-tailed, left-tailed, two-tailed, comes from the problem itself. So we have to be able to read keywords into the problem to know if it's going to be right-tailed, left-tailed, or two-tailed. Okay, so this is our claim, that the researcher thinks that um, these people are older. All right, so now we have to find our critical value. Okay, so the critical value, so we're given um, alpha equals 0 0.05. Okay, so if alpha equals 0 0.05, and our test is right-tailed. Okay, so I'm just going to draw a picture. Just I like pictures. All right, so this is my picture. So we're seeing that the mean is 46, and it's right-tailed because the doctor thinks that um, the, the age at, at the hospital is older than. So I need to find the Z value that corresponds to alpha equals 0 0.05. So this region here is equal to area equals our probability, which is equal to alpha, which is equal to 0 0.05. We were given that alpha test at the alpha 0 0.05 level. That's the most common statistical level because it's big enough that maybe you're going to catch things, okay? It also corresponds to our 95% confidence interval, okay? If we were to think about confidence intervals, um, but it's, um, it's kind of like the minimum that um, alpha level, significance level that people will accept as things being significantly different. All right, so now from our Z table. What, what is the area? Sorry. I it's 0 0.05, the area, the area from our Z alpha, right here, the shaded region, is the probability, right? Because this comes from our normal distribution, which is the probability density function. Oh, I see. And that probability is equal to our alpha. Okay, not alpha over two, but alpha because this is a single tailed test. So I don't split the alpha into two different values. And so that area is equal to 0 0.05. So I look on my <coughs> Z table, right? And I say, this is, the Z table gives me the areas under the curve, which is our probabilities. I find the one that corresponds to 0 0.05, and I look for the Z value. Because this is right tilde, it's gonna be a positive um, uh, Z value. So from the Z table, Z alpha, I looked it up, was equal to positive 1.65. So Z alpha equals 1.65. Okay, right tilde positive Z value is 1.65. So our critical value, that's our critical value, Z equals 1.65. That comes from our table. That comes from the parameters that we're using to define this example. We tested the alpha 0 0.05 level. Now we know what our critical value is gonna be. We look it up on the table. Okay, so critical value. Now I have to calculate the test statistic. Okay, the test statistic comes from our data. Okay, the test statistic is what I'm going to use to compare to my critical value. And based on where my test statistic falls, if it falls in this region or if it falls in my non-critical region, I can say I'm going to reject or not reject my null hypothesis. So my test statistic 
where I calculate the z-value based on what we have. So this is x bar minus mu sigma over radical n. So now I plug in my specific experimental information. So this is um, 48.6. That comes from our sample information minus our population, 46 all over. We were given the standard deviation, um, which is 4.2, all over radical 30, right? Plugging in all the information that we had before. This, once I multiply it out, I get 3.39. Okay, so my test statistic is equal to 3.39. Okay, so now I have to make a decision. Okay, my fourth step. I have to make a decision. I have to compare my critical value and my test statistic. So, compare critical value and test statistic. Okay, we're dealing with the right tail test. My critical value, let's draw this out again. Okay, this way, I'm just going to write 1.65 to define our critical region here. Okay, so here's my, sorry, here's my critical value. Okay, my test statistic is 3.39. That puts it right about here, or even over here. I'm going to um, 3.39. So this is my test statistic. Okay, so since my test statistic is greater than my critical value, right, 3.39 is greater than 1.65. Okay, that means that my value, my, my test statistic falls within the critical region. So then um, your data, which is, um, which we've reduced down to a test statistic, falls within our critical region. We call it the critical region because it's the region um, within which values are significant. Okay, they're significantly different from our mean. So it falls within to, into the critical region. So therefore, based on this, because it falls into our critical region, my decision is going to be, I'm gonna reject the null hypothesis which means I can conclude that, hey, maybe the doctors in this hospital are actually older than the national average. So I can say reject the null hypothesis. So what I'll write in words is based on the data, the average <coughs> age of the doctors in this hospital is actually is older and the age of doctors in the U.S. as a whole, as a whole. Okay, so I'm kind of rephrasing my hypothesis. So see, uh, it, we're not actually committing. We're saying, yeah, definitely these doctors are older. We're saying based on the data that we have, okay, that we can reject the hypothesis, the null hypothesis that says that they're not different, okay, and based on that, the average age of the doctors in this hospital are actually older. They're bigger. That's a bigger number than the average age in the U.S. as a whole. Okay. So there are four pieces to what you need to do when you do this stuff. You want to do the state your hypothesis. Okay. So you're basically rewriting your question, but with um, your hypothesis um, labeled out. Calculate your critical value that comes from your alpha. Okay. Your z value from your table from your alpha level. <laughs> you calculate your test statistic. This comes from your specific data, your Z value. This is what you're going to compare to the critical value. Okay. Then you're going to make your decision based on the comparison between the critical value and the test statistic. Right. Our test statistic is greater than the critical value. You have to say you have to state this part right here. Okay. So that puts our test statistic within the critical region. Okay. And then you have to make your you have to make your final conclusion. It isn't enough to do all this stuff. You actually have to say whether you reject or fail to reject your null hypothesis. Okay, you don't necessarily have to rewrite it like this. Um, that's just so that you can, you know, kind of, sorry, I'm going to sneeze. Um, so you can conceptualize what we're trying to do. Okay, but you have to say you re this is your decision. We reject the null hypothesis. Okay, so these four pieces is, are what you're going to need. You don't have to draw the pictures. Pictures will help you as you're working through this problem problems to begin with. I find them helpful. Okay. Anybody need more time to keep writing before I move on to the next example? 
Okay. I Great. Got it. So example two, oops, it's one of the, these uh, examples are one of the reasons why I typed them all up I'm at the beginning because it can take forever to write all these up on the board. All right, so for a specific year, the average score in the SAT math test was um, 515. The, this variable, the scores, um, is normally distributed in the population standard deviation is 100. So a particular school wants to know if their students scored significantly below the national average so they selected 36 students at random from their population, and they found that the average of this group was 509.028. That the alpha 0.1 levels, so we're doing a different alpha level, is there a significant difference in this group? Now, just to let you know, experimentally, alpha 0.1 is, is a pretty high alpha um, that wouldn't be considered um, like a valid uh, statistical difference, okay? Um, but we're doing these things just so you can see all the different values that we're choosing. All right. So let's go ahead and start this like we have been um, in the past. So I need to write down my, my different pieces. So my hypothesis, my hypothesis is that the null hypothesis, my mean is equal to 515, okay? Versus my alternative hypothesis that the mean is less than 515. Because look, they wanna know if, if their students scored below. So is their average less than the average, okay? So this is our claim here, okay, our alternative hypothesis. Okay, and I'm getting all this up, I'm pulling it all out from the question itself. I have to calculate my critical value. Okay, at the alpha 0 0.1 level, right? This is, um, it's less than, so this is the left tailed test. I'm just gonna draw a quick picture so I can visualize. All right, so this is my mean equals 515. All right, so this is a left tail test. The area here is equal to 0 0.1. That's my area under the curve is equal to my alpha. So I need my Z alpha. What's the Z value that's gonna correspond to give me the area less than um, uh, this is z value, the area that's equal to 0 0.1. So my from the table, table, the z alpha value, it's gonna be negative now because we're on the left-hand side. It's gonna be minus 1.28, okay? This is our critical value. So I'm gonna underline that because I need that. And you have to state my hypothesis, the critical value, my test statistic and my decision, All right? So let's calculate our test statistic. Okay, so the test statistic, remember, is z equals x bar minus mu sigma over radical n. So I'm going to plug in um, what we have, and then we're going to calculate. So my x bar is my sample, 509.028, minus my population average, which I said was 515, all over my standard deviation, that's 100, divided by square root of n. So plug it all in, you know, multiply it out, divide it, um, and I find my z value is equal to what I get minus 0 0.36. Okay, so this is my test statistic. So let's just write on my graph. So this critical value is minus 1.28. This is minus 0.36. So we're looking at minus 0.36. Just so you can kind of get a visual on it. So this is our test statistic. Hmm, you guys can kind of maybe start to see, right? My test statistic is not within my critical region, okay? So I'm gonna use that, I'm gonna use that to make my decision. Okay, so my test statistic, so the test statistic, in this case is greater than my critical value. In this case, being greater than means that it's not in the critical region because it's a left tail test. For it to be significant, it, the test statistic would have to be less than my critical value. But in this case, minus 0 0.36 is greater than minus 1.28, which means it is in the non-critical region. Okay, if it's in the non-critical region, it means that based on the data, these things aren't significantly different. Okay, so I'm gonna say therefore, we're going to fail to reject the null hypothesis. Okay, so based on the data that we have here, 
right? There isn't enough data to show us that there's a difference between this school's <clears throat> average SAT score and the national average SAT score, okay? Maybe they want to increase, they want to broaden out, do more than 36 students, or they want to kind of get a bigger picture, or maybe they're okay with that. So we're just going to leave it like that. Okay, but we can see it right here, that our test statistic is not within our critical region. Okay. okay so we did a right tail test, left tail test. We're going to do a two tail test now. I'll tell you ahead of time. Does anybody need more time to write this before I flip the page? Give me one sec. Okay. All right, so moving on to example three. All right, so example three says, um, a researcher finds that the average cost of rehabilitation for stroke victims is 24,672. They want to compare this with a local hospital. So they select 35 patients and find that their average cost is this, 26,343. The standard deviation of our population of this value is 3,251. At the alpha 0.01 level, which is a pretty tight alpha level, by the way, it's a nice um, statistical level, can it be concluded that the two top clock costs are different? And we're gonna assume that the data are normally distributed, okay? So can we conclude that the two costs are different? Not, is this greater than, or is this less than, okay? But are they different? So based on what this is saying here, we're looking at a two-tailed test. Okay, so I'm going to set up my values. So my hypothesis, I'm going to state my hypothesis. So my null hypothesis is that the mean is equal to 24,672. That's my population, okay, versus my alternative hypothesis is that the mean is not equal to this value here, 24,672. So did you know I didn't put in the value at the local hospital. Because the, the question was, are these different? If the question is, are these different, then I'm dealing with a two-tailed test. This is our claim. And then this is a two-tailed test, okay, based on what's being said here. Because we have to learn how to decode what's being asked. So if it's right-tailed, left-tailed, or two-tailed, okay? But given that it's um, a two-tailed test, we have to think about our critical values. Critical values. I've got two because I've got the positive and negative z values. Okay, so this is a two tailed test. So I'm dealing with an alpha over two. So let's just draw a quick picture here. All right, so here's our mean. So here's our positive z alpha over two. That's a two. Is our negative z alpha over two. So I have two critical regions, right? One corresponding to an area that's with alpha over two as that area under the curve. Here, and this is alpha over two. That shaded region corresponds to the probability, but it's the area under the curve, which is alpha over two. So I have to find the z values that go with alpha over two. So my alpha over two, is equal to 0 0.005, okay? I look up on my Z table for the probability that's 0 0.005, and I'm from our table, I find my Z alpha over two is equal to plus or minus 2.575. Okay. It's not exactly equal to 0 0.005. You can, I think it's like 2.57 is what our table goes up to. Okay, but if it's between 2.57 and 2.58, then make it 2.575, okay? You have some latitude for how you're going to um, do that if you have to um, interpret the values. Okay, so now I need a test statistic. Okay, so my test statistic comes from the data that we're working with. So my Z, remember this is X bar minus mu, 
sigma over radical n. I'm going to plug in what we have. So my x bar is the value at this hospital. So 26,343. That comes from this local hospital. Mu is our population, 24,672. Divided by, they told us the standard deviation, 3,251. And then um, they looked at 35. Okay, so radical 35. So I'm going to plug it all in. Multiply, divide out. And I'm going to get my test statistic z value equals 3.04. Okay, so I have to compare that with what I've got. So let's write down. So this is um, positive 2.575. This is negative 2.575 on our graph. That's our z value. I have a z value equal to 3.04. That falls like I'll write it right here. Here's our test statistic. So that's our z value. Okay, so that. Um, I can make a decision based on how I compare my z value. If they were going to be different, my test statistic would either be greater than the positive critical value or less than the negative critical value. We have two different things I have to compare, greater than the positive or less than the negative, because it's a two-tailed test. So my decision based on my test statistic and my critical value. So I say my test statistic. 0.04 is greater than the positive critical value, right, which was um, positive 2.573, which puts it in the critical region, okay? So therefore, I can reject our null hypothesis. All right, so what does that mean? I'm going to write that in words. So we can say based on the data, um, this hospital has a higher cost than average. Okay. So we're rejecting the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis was that there's no difference in price. The alternative hypothesis is that there is a difference in price. Notice how I didn't say we're going to accept the alternative. I said we're going to reject the null hypothesis okay. based on where our test statistic fell within our critical region. Okay. So that's doing our Z test, okay? Right-tailed, left-tailed, two-tailed. <laughs> we talked before about how there were two ways of testing things. One was the Z test, one was the p-value. Okay, this is using the Z test. Um, I'm gonna switch gears and we're gonna do things, I'm gonna talk about what it means to use the p-value to talk about um, statistical difference. P-values are just basically comparing the probabilities with our alpha or alpha over two, okay? It's the same idea because instead of dealing with converting it to a z value and comparing these test statistics, I'm just going to deal with probability. So both are uh, the same thing. They're just kind of looking at it one with a z value, one with the probability. But it's important that you know both. Um, anybody still need to write this down before I take the paper away? Okay, good. All right. <clears throat> so let's talk about our p value. This is our second method. This is our p-value method. And you will be asked to do both. You'll be told to use the p-value method at different times. So um, the p-value, let's talk about what that means, the p-value. Uh, this is a lot of words. Let me just write it down. It's the smallest significance level alpha that leads us to oops, reject the null hypothesis. So we're given alpha, right? We're told, um, do the statistical test at the alpha level, alpha equals 0.05, alpha equals 0.01, alpha equals something, right? Now, we don't deal with the test statistic per se in terms of our z value, but <laughs> we're gonna need to find out what's the probability. We're gonna compare our alpha with our probability. So we'll go through and we'll talk about what that means. Um, so the p-value method is um, essentially the probability that we would observe a more extreme statistic than we did, did um, when the null hypothesis 
is true. Let me just draw a picture so you can see what we're talking about. So I'm going to try to make this big so we have enough room. So here's our normal curve and here's our mean. Okay. So say, for example, I've got different, I'm going to really exaggerate these values. So the area, area here, equals 0 0.05. Okay, I'll do these in different colors. So my area here, this whole area equals 0 0.05, right? If you can kind of see that a little bit, the paint on the graph. Um, so let's say from here on, my area equals 0 0.035, say for example, draw that in a different color. So just from here onwards, my area equals 0 0.035. And then say for example, from here onwards, my area equals 0 0.01. That's like our common alpha. That darker. Okay. So what we're doing when we talk about our p-value is basically looking at based on what we're given for an alpha, I'm going to be calculating a p-value and see if my p-value falls within the re region, okay, um, region of my critical value. Is it greater than or less than? Does it encompass it or does it fall within it? Okay, so our decision rule, okay, um, when using a p-value is going to look like um, if the p-value is less than or equal to alpha, then we can reject the null hypothesis. If the p-value is greater than alpha, then we do not reject the null hypothesis. So all that means, right, so if it's less than, so if my alpha is this whole big area here and my p-value says, oh, we're falling in here, that means that my p-value sits well within my alpha value. So the p-value is incorporated completely into my critical region then I can reject the null hypothesis. My p-value even comes outside of my critical region even just a little bit, right? That means I'm not gonna reject my null hypothesis because my p-value is bigger than that. And there's some nuances here based on um, two-tailed or one-tailed and, and all that, but we're, um, let's go through some examples so that you can see how the p-value is, um, how it works. Anybody need to keep writing that before I pull out the example? Right, so um, I'm looking at example four. So example four says, <clears throat> the claim is that the average cost of tuition at a four-year public college is greater than 5,700. Um, the researcher selects a random sample of 36 four-year public colleges and finds the mean to be 5950. Population is normally distributed and the standard deviation is 659. Is there evidence to support this claim at the alpha 0 0.05 level? Um, use the p-value method. Okay, so now we were told um, it finds, and so they want to find out if it's greater than, so our, our question is telling us that we're dealing with a right-tailed test. So greater than means right-tailed. Okay, so I'm going to start thinking about um, drawing things out. So my first off, my hypothesis. Okay, my hypothesis is going to be that um, my null hypothesis is that the mean is equal to 5,700. Okay, that was given to us right here. Okay, versus my uh, alternative hypothesis that the mean's greater than that. This is our claim. <clears throat> okay. We have to state our hypothesis first off. Now, our test value. Now, we don't have like a critical value. We have a test value. Test value. Okay. So normally, um, we'd be looking at, uh, um, let's see. Okay. So my Z equals X bar minus mu sigma over radical N. Okay. So I'm going to plug in the values that we have to come up with my test value. So I'm going to go 5950 minus 5700 all over our standard deviation, 659 all over radical. Um, 36. Okay, and I get a z value equal to 2.28. Okay, that's my test value. Now I have to look at my p value. Okay, so what does that mean? I'm looking at the probability that z might from my table, probability that z is less than or equal to 2.28. 
Remember, that's how our table is read, okay? And that's equal to 0 0.9887, right? So we're looking like this. C equals 2.28. This whole area here, 9.9887 is the area under the curve to the left of that bar, okay? But since we have a right tailed test, right, we're looking at like this. So this is z equals 2.28, and we're looking at a right tail test. This is what we want right here. Okay, it's a right tail test. So the area <clears throat> based on our alpha, okay, my area for my critical region, my alpha equals 0 0.05. Okay, so let's do this. So the probability that z is greater than or equal to 2.28, let's calculate that first, it's going to equal 1 minus probability that z is less than 2.28. That's 1 minus 0 0.9887, and that's going to give us 0 0.0113. Okay, so <clears throat> here's our mean, 700. Okay, so now what happens is, um, based on my data, right, so with this 2.28, right, the area under this curve here is equal to 0 0.0113. That's according to my z value of 2.28. But my um, <laughs> my alpha value, 0 0.05, I'm gonna draw this here. So this here, whole thing, corresponds to an alpha equals 0 0.05, okay? So 0 0.05 is greater than 0 0.0113. So 0 0.0113 is an area, as a probability, okay? is encompassed within 0 0.05. It's a right tail test, so I don't cut the alpha in half, okay? So now, based on, I'm just graphing this out so we can see where things are. So this is my um, p-value, okay? So now my decision. Okay, I'm comparing my p-value with the alpha, remember. Okay, so my alpha equals 0 0.05, okay? And the p-value, equals 0 0.0113, okay? So because our p-value is less than our alpha, 0 0.0113, 0 0.05, what we can do is we can reject the null hypothesis, okay? Because our p-value is contained within our alpha value, okay? It's within that critical region, okay? <clears throat> so I can reject the null hypothesis based on our p-value method, okay? So rejecting the null hypothesis means that the mean values at these four-year public colleges is greater than $5,700, okay? Right. That was with a single tail test or right tail test. Um, I'm going to leave you with a two-tail test um, and a p-value, and that'll... Um, close up of this chapter, but also give you an idea for how you think about the p-value when we have to split it, when the alpha gets split into two different pieces. Okay, everybody need more time writing this um, example? Everybody good? Okay, so our next example, example five. I'm telling you ahead of time it's a two-tailed test, but um, we'll figure out why. All right, so <laughs> This says the average wind speed for a particular city is eight miles per hour. Um, a sample of 32 days has an average of 8.2 uh, miles per hour. The population is normally distributed, okay, but we also know our n is greater than 30, and it has a standard deviation of 0.6. So our population standard deviation, right, and our population um, is, um, let's see, 8.2. I'm sorry, our population is eight. So at the alpha 0 0.05 level, is there enough evidence to reject the claim? Hmm, well, what's the claim? Uh, we're not actually told what the claim is, but the claim is like, we think that they're different, okay? So it's not saying that they're greater or lesser, okay? But we're saying that they're, that they're different. So are they different? Okay, which is a safe bet. If they don't say, hey, it's greater than or lesser than, um, you can assume that they're gonna be different, or you can specify your own hypothesis. Normally, we'll tell you that they're greater or less, but I'm gonna write down, are they different? Which is gonna give me a two-tailed test. So first off, I need to write my hypothesis. Okay, so my H naught, I'll say the mean is equal to eight miles per hour. That comes from here. 
versus our claim, our alternative hypothesis, that the mean is not equal to eight. Okay. <clears throat> Right, so now our test value, we're told to use the p-value method, so our test value, right, notice how I'm not looking up a critical value, I'm looking up a test value. <laughs> the critical value is based on our alpha, but the test value is based on our data. So test value is z equals, um, so we're gonna go 8.2 minus eight, so this is x bar minus our mean, divided by our standard deviation, 0 0.6, divided by radical, um, would we have 32. Okay, so I plug them all in, I multiply everything out, divide everything out, I'm gonna get z equals um, 1.89, okay? So because this is two-tailed, let me just draw out a picture here. I'm gonna draw out a picture. Okay, so this is our mean equals eight, this is eight here. Um, and it's two-tailed. We were told um, alpha 0 0.05, so that means that my alpha gets split into two. So this is alpha over two is alpha over two. So the area under this curve here is equal to 0 0.025, right? Because my alpha is 0 0.05 and then my alpha over two is 0 0.025. Okay, so that's the value that I'm gonna be comparing with. I, that defines my critical region. So from my test value, I have to figure out a p-value for that, right? <clears throat> so we am gonna get our p-value. Okay, so my probability that z is less than or equal to 1.89 is equal to 0 0.9706, right? So that's like, I've got a z value, 1.89, that gives me this value right here, okay? <clears throat> so now the probability that z is greater than 1.89, it's going to be 1 minus the probability that z is less than 1.89, okay? So this is gonna to equal to um, 0 0.0294, right? So I subtracted one minus 0 0.9706. Okay, so that's my P value, 0 0.0294. Okay. Okay, so now let's take a look. This is 0 0.025, I have 0 0.029. So my P value, I'll draw it in a different color. My P value comes out right here. My p-value gives me this whole area here. And because it's two-tailed, my p-value gives me this whole area here. Okay, so my p-value is bigger than my alpha over two region. If the p-value is bigger than my alpha over two, then I'm, that means I'm in trouble. Um, okay, so now <clears throat> what I need to do is I can do one of two things. I can say I'm gonna compare 0 0.029 with alpha over two, right? So p-value compared with alpha over two, okay? So my p-value is 0 0.0294, that's bigger than 0 0.025. So we can say we're gonna um, not reject, reject our null hypothesis. That's one way. Why did you, why do we use the p-value of when z is greater than or equal to 1.89 instead of I suppose I could have used the lesser one. Um, this would be a negative z value. So what happened was, um, so we had, when we calculated our test value, it was a positive. And it's true that there's symmetry. So I could have gotten the negative. I could have found the um, z value and made it negative. It would have been 0 0.0294. Um, but because we had a positive z value, then I'm looking at what's the area going this way, right? And because of symmetry, it's gonna be the same area on this side. We, we could have easily have done minus 1.89 and found 0 0.0294, there's symmetry. Okay. Okay. But because this one came up positive, I just used the positive aspect of it, right, to calculate it out. Um, but we could have made it negative and then found this aspect of it here. It's and then you know it's going to give us the same value. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Great. So um, one, I can compare the p-value with alpha over two, or if I want to compare it with, um, I can compare the p-value with alpha. then I have to bring my alpha up to be alpha not divided by two anymore. So that means that I have to take my p-value and I have to multiply it by two, 0 0.0294, right? So I've got, if I'm just gonna compare it with alpha, this p-value is split into two, and then I have to compare that with um, 0 0.0588. 
and my alpha is equal to 0 0.05, right? So 0 0.0588 is still greater than 0 0.05 you would expect it to be. So then that means that our p-value is greater than alpha. So this is our two times our p-value is greater than alpha. Okay, both of these are fine. Personally, I find this method a little bit more intuitive where I'm comparing my p-value with the alpha over two. But if you wanted to compare it with the alpha, which is technically the way we're supposed to think about it, I have to multiply my p-value by two because this p-value corresponds to only a half of what I'm looking at. So now my decision, I wrote it over there. Um, we're going to fail to reject our null hypothesis. Okay, because the p-value is uh, greater than alpha, or because the um, two times the p-value is greater than alpha, or our p-value is greater than alpha over two. Essentially, our p-value, our probability, right, of this based on our test value is greater than our test um, statistic, right? They gave us um, alpha equals 0 0.05, right, based on our critical value. Okay. <clears throat> You're asked to do things with the p-value method, so um, that's why uh, we're talking about it. <coughs> you can use either p-value method or z method if you're not told either way. But now you have two different ways of doing it. But you know, p-value and z are just two sides of the same coin because we're still using values from a probability table. I'm either using the probabilities, then I'm going to compare it with alpha, or I'm going to use the z values, which are associated with that probability, and compare it with my critical value. The so same same things. Okay. All right. So that's basically chapter 6.2. Very powerful chapter. Um, where we're starting to get into statistics and doing hypothesis testing. Um, based on the information that we're given, we're going to calculate critical values, um, we're going to calculate p-values, we're going to make decisions about whether samples and populations are different from each other, or there, are they statistically considered not different from each other. Okay, so that's it. Um, I'll have office hours today in about an hour. If you guys um, want to come by, you can ask about homework questions or whatever. Um, and uh, otherwise, have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.